All right, we're going live and so we're still on the series uh, talking about, uh, you know, every hateful bird, talking about how birds and how um, trees and all these kind of are emblems in the Bible to represent the female or feminine uh, characteristics. And we can see a lot of symbolism in the Bible. And the reason for this is in the, there is a reason that, uh, that the tree and the bird and all these things are feminine because God, uh, all of God's creation, his word, he spoke his word and his word is masculine. His, his seed, it's his seed, his word. And it, and he put plants it and then it produces life. So anything that produces life or sprouts us or germinates or incubates or anything that grows, life comes forth is a female counterpart, right? Mm -hmm. So this is why there are certain things in creation, but say, what does he, what, what he does is counterfeit and uh, corrupts that which God has established. So he comes and twists it and perverts it, correct? So in, in, in the creation story or the creation of trees serves as a testament to God's wisdom, creativity, and provision. The lush vegetation, because a full, fruitful, you know, remember when they were going into the promised land, uh, uh, the promise was that the land would be flowing with milk and honey and it would have great vegetation. It would be a, 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 a luscious land, right? It will be full of vitality, full of, full of life, full of vigor and life. And, the, and they, what they say, they, when they went into the promised land, that the grapes were as big as men and they, were, and they had great vegetation. So it's like an oasis or a paradise, right? And full of, of, of vegetation. It's, a, it's, a, uh, it's pleasure, right? You know, when we see all the, the green uh, foliage, when spring comes forth it, with all the, the green foliage, we, we, start to, we start to come alive, do we not? We start to feel the energy. We start feeling vibrant and we're excited for the, the new season. And uh, it brings a sense of well-being and enthusiasm in your life. Just, just the appearance of seeing the uh, flowers blossom and the green uh, foliage and just seeing the, the vibrance of the earth. So this is a masterpiece of God's creation, and He so it it, it depicts a, a a a paradise, pleasure, a place of enjoyment. So the Garden of Eden means it was a garden of pleasure, or it was a a, a fenced in place of a pleasure for uh, that God put man in the garden, and it was a place. It was a paradise. It was an oasis. Correct. Mm -hmm. So uh, again means a, a border or a fixed or garden. Uh, and so, and the Eden means pleasure. So anyways, this is what, what the Garden of Eden was all about. God, the Bible says that, you know, there's pleasure at God's right hand. So mm -hmm. be it, this it signifies a place of authority, a place of rulership, because Adam was given a position. He wasn't just created as a one of the uh, species of the earth, but he was created ab above the species, but lower than the angels. And he was created for a position, a, pay, a position uh, of honor and, uh, and authority and power to rule uh, with God, not, not outside of God. Is that correct? It's, he was, he was God's husband and he was his, uh, uh, keeper of the garden. He was the he was the mediator or the the uh, administrator to God's creative, uh, you know, his creation and his creative. Uh, uh, he even gave man that creative ability to be able to uh, create himself and also to name the animals. So there was a sense of wisdom. So he gave him 
a sense of responsibility. Is that correct? Not only a place of authority and power, but there was a sense of responsibility. And so God, like in part into humanity, the same kind of uh, attributes and characteristics of being uh, like God in his character and attributes of being able to create and to be able to uh, to be to be able to perform and be able to see the vitality and the life come forth out of something that they've done with their hands. Right. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, so this was a, a, a gift from God. God, this was not a man did not earn it. It was a gift of God that they were placed in this garden. And this shows God's wisdom, his creativity and his provision that we, our dependency is on God, not on ourselves. Even though we have some of the same characteristics God in, in, instilled in us, his likeness and his image to be able to do certain things, but we do nothing outside of him because outside of him, it becomes a distorted, uh, a distorted uh, creation and a perverted creation. He can only bring life and vitality to that which he, the, of the works of your hand. He can only bless it or curse it, right? Mm -hmm. So anyways, uh, so the lush vegetation, including uh, included med, a majestic, the, uh, the majestic trees. So trees were included in this creation and they uh, God uh, created majestic trees and he uh, cre created uh, oak trees and he created uh, fruit bearing trees. He carried blossoming trees. And so we're going to look at some of these trees, trees of the Bible and his creation, because they're uh, just not the they're all in in retrospect are feminine uh, in, you know, in the symbolism. And but there are some trees that show stature and strength and character and these and, and shows uh they're unmovable, unshakable. The, the Bible says that he wants, uh, that he, he promises to plant us beside still water so that we will grow and blossom and that we will grow in full stature, right? We'll be strengthened from the core. So there, there are depictions of, in scripture of trees being cedar trees or oak trees, str uh, trees of strength, trees of, of, you know, like admiration of, of, of exaltation. Do you see they are, they, they are, they're trees of splendor, right? Mm -hmm. And they're, and they, and they, and their heights are really tall and, they, and they're exalted above all the other trees. So we're going to get into some scriptures of that. So we're looking at the trees that God, uh, he wants to plant us, right, like trees so that we can be, and that and by the still waters, this represents the spirit of God flowing in in our midst and through us, right? Because this, it's the spirit of God working in us and abiding in us that gives us the strength to be, to grow up in the stature that God has called us to be as cedar trees, the scripture says, or like oak trees, you know, that we will not be hard, hard, hardened, like for like with the hardness of life, but that we be strengthened from within, that we're unshakable, unmovable. The word says that the, the word of God is, is planted like a mustard seed. So he uses the the uh, the symbolism of a mustard tree, though the seed be very small, it grows into a huge, gigantic, uh, strong tree. It's it's not easily moved. It's not easily taken, you know, taken down. So those are the and so when we build our faith and where we're strengthened in faith, when we plant the word of God inside of us. And that and that faith grows. It should it should grow up inside of us like a mustard tree, so that we're unshakable, we're un, uh, unmovable. We're we cannot be moved very easily. We're not easily swayed from the left and to the right. We are we are fixed, and we are strengthened, and our and we're lifted up on above the earth, right above the 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 average trees. Correct. 
So anyway, so this these are uh, these are some of the symbolism in scripture, and it says, so the majestic trees are described as good, and uh, and they form the backdrops for uh, backdrops for the harmonious relationship between humanity and God. So biblical trees symbolize life, growth, and fertility. Also, it means abundantly blessed, and and also it means to thrive within God's creation. So these are what trees represent. But we are like trees, and we, God uh, uses trees to also uh, describe men, men or women in Scripture. Uh, he he also you know he also said that the giants were as tall as cedar trees. Uh, so there, so he uses a lot of symbolism to show us, and uh, you know, to to show us a, a a pattern, right, of how that there is a distinction between what God calls good and what he calls and what he calls bad, because what what did Satan do? He went about to pervert that which God created, right? And it said in Proverbs. Um, uh, well, not proper sense, but you just throughout scripture, we can see in first Kings 14 and 23, uh, it says, for they also built them high places and images and groves uh, and every high hill and under every great tree. And second Kings 16, four, it says, and he sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. So, uh, you know, it, God is saying that they perverted themselves under every green tree. They had humbled themselves or they worship the creation rather than cr the creator. It says in 2 Kings 17, 10, and they set them up images and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. 2 Chronicles 28, 4, he sacrificed also the burnt incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. And Isaiah 57, 5, inflaming yourself with idols under every green tree, slaying the children in the valley under the cities of the rocks. For of old time I have broken thy yoke and burst thy bands, and thy and thou sayest, I will not transgress what upon every high hill and under every green tree thou wanderest playing the harlot. So there is a worship of creation, and there is a perversion which takes you into a deep deeper perversions that that we bow to the things of the earth and God says that you had corrupted yourself played the harlot under every green tree and this is because the tree represents the feminist uh, goddess worship or it can also represent a tree planted by steel waters and that you can grow up you are a a body of messiah you are a church which is feminine you are a temple of the holy spirit that his word is planted correct and you uh, and that you will grow up into his character right because you are growing in faith uh, amuna faith which strengthens you to become a tree by living waters right mm -hmm. so you can you can pervert yourself or you can be a tree that is is a is connected to the tree of life that is bringing forth life and that is and that it and it is a, and that it is not movable it's unshakable it can it can't you cannot you can't pluck it its roots grow really deep Right. Mm -hmm. Because it's because its foundation is on the word of God. And that's the difference. And it says, uh, uh, Jeremiah says, the Lord said unto me in those days of Josiah, the king, hast thou seen which the backsliding Israel had done? She has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree and had played the harlot. Uh, so. 
And, and, and then Ezekiel says the same. Um, it says, Then ye shall know I, the Lord, when their slain shall be among their idols, round about their altars and every high hill, and in all the tops of the mountains and under every green tree, under every thick oak, the place where they did offer sweet savors uh, to all their idols. And they, said, and they say to the forest of the south, Here is the word of the Lord. That says the Lord, behold, I will kindle a fire in thee and it shall devour every green tree in thee and every dry tree. The flaming uh, flaming flame shall not be quenched and all the faces from the south and north shall be burned therein. So uh, so that that's a good that it says and they say unto the forest of the south, hear the word of the Lord and saith the Lord, behold, I will kindle a fire in thee. And it shall devour every green tree in thee and every dry tree. And the flaming, fl uh, so God's going to come up and burn every tree, every devour, every tree and every dry tree that is not, uh, that is not saturated with the power and the spirit of God. And the flame, flaming flame shall not be quenched and all the faces from the south to the north shall be burned there ever. So, um, so there is judgment that is pending to those who, who worship the earth, who worship the things of the world and the gods of the earth, because everything in creation uh, is, is uh, that is worship is, it's tied to a fallen angel or is tied to a principality or power or, or, you know, a, a fallen creature, which, it also ties with the whore of Babylon, which connects you to uh, to Satan himself or Lucifer. So anyway, so we're going to look at some of these trees and, I'm, and I've pulled up some articles because uh, trees means, like I've spoken before, it means God's wisdom. And we can see that they use Athena, the goddess, which represents Lilith, which also represents all the goddesses, with an owl, which owl represents wisdom. Sophia, also in the Greek, is also known as wisdom. So, and they, so a tree and a bird is really synonymous because they are one and the same. Because they, in, in you know, in the retrospect of Bible uh, symbol symbolism, because the bird uh, is. You, you know, represents wisdom. It, you know, the owl, the great owl, which the owl, uh, let's see, I believe it was in Isaiah 34. Let me look that up. It, go. Yeah, but let's see. Yes, it says that uh, they shall call the nobles thereof to the kingdom, but none shall be there and her princes shall be nothing. And the thorns shall come up in her places, nestled and uh, brambled in the fortresses thereof. And it shall be a habitation of dragons and a court for owls, which owls in that translation is Lilith which is the twisting of the light or the, so she was supposed to be a cohort or a, a, a counterpart of Lucifer or a companion of Lucifer or Lucifer's wife. And in mythology, she was supposedly the wife of Adams. She was the first wife and she represents the feminist move, movement. And it says, and the wild beast of the desert shall also meet with the wild beast of the islands and the setar shall cry to his fellow, and the screech owl also shall rest there, and for herself a place of rest. There shall the great owl make her nest, and lay, and hatch, and gather under her shadows. There shall be the vultures also be gathered, every one with her mate. Seek ye out of the brooks of the Lord and read, no one of these shall fail. None shall want her mate for by mouth it has commanded and her, his spirit hath gathered them. And he hath cast her lots for them and his hands has divided it upon them by line by line. 
They shall possess it forever from generation to generation shall they dwell therein. And I believe they're talking about Babylon. Yeah. Come out of Babylon because this is where this is where uh, the uh, the corruption of Satan has gotten humanity to worship the things of the earth, looking for signs in the earth, looking for uh, remedies of the earth, looking for pleasures in the earth, looking for their substance in the earth, bowing to the the uh, the traditions of men that are all geared around earthly wanting desires, which is fleshly desires, things that uh, entice. So a lot of these uh, these uh, symbolism have to do with fertility, which you know absolutely is uh, this uh, we're worshiping the uh, the uh, female and male genitals. So this is all why it's an abomination. It's an abomination unto God because you have you're you worshiping the creation and, and, and not worshiping the creator. So and you know, Lilith, which means night or the twisting or the owl. And what she does, she, she uh, in scripture, she's uh, in in Hebrew. Uh, let me look that up. She. Uh, she uh, bl blends both light and darkness. She's she she brings both. She brings in confusion. She brings in both the uh, sh uh, the gray, the gray areas, or the uh, you know the, the the you know good and evil. She's supposed to be balancing both the good and evil. This is why we see in the yi yang symbolism both male and female and both good and bad light and darkness Lilith, name of the female goddess known as night demon who hunts the desolation places in edom a nocturnal animal that inhabits desolate places the screed owl which is uh lilith the screech owl which is a feminine noun a goddess and so she and she and so all other goddesses is kind of she's the prototype and all other goddesses kind of follow kind of suit with different names. This is why when I was talking last time in, uh, in my last uh, about Absalom and about how in David's kingdom before he uh, before he, uh, you know, committed adultery with uh, Bathsheba that he was already varying away from the character of God. See, during the time of his reign, while he was in battle, while he was fighting the giants, while he was possessing the land, he was he was needing of God. He was needing of his uh, strength, you know, to get him through day by day, right? And so, you know, but when you're not finally fighting the battles, and I read that in my book, that he was he was supposed to be out for war, but he he stayed back from war. And there in that time when he stayed back, he found himself in temptation. But prior to that, and uh, and I go into more detail in this book that he he was building his house. He was he he was building a castle. And he was built and he had enlarged his borders and he had uh, brought in the Felician people to be able to help him in these projects. And he and his contractor was Hiram, uh, you know, Hiram from the king of Tarsus, which, you know, he was a uh, he was he was part of the Felician king. And he brought in the cedar trees that built the both the the house of God and the, and the palaces of both King David and Solomon. And he brought in the labor to do that, but he was, but he worshiped other gods. And so, but, so they had a mixture of Felician people and of the, uh, and of the Hebrews. So, and so they started to adopt their traditions and their ways. And so, so his, per, uh, his uh, purpose, you know, when David, came and uh and brought him in you know his perspective had changed his you know his purposes in, of of his life before he was trying to meet the goals of life meet 
this, you know, God had promised him as a young kid that he was going to be king over all of Israel. And but he was even though he was anointed as king, he was not yet enthroned as king. And so he was waiting patiently and doing his uh, due diligence to uh, in 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 the in the formation of God created him to be a righteous, holy king. And so that he would serve him and be able to uphold him in his kingdom. But when you, but when you're not engaging in warfare, when you're not up against the battles, when you're not in this complete dependency on God to get you through day by day, you're going to fall into uh, the carnal ways of life. You're going, your appetites and things are going to, uh, to be more, uh, more prevalent than, than, uh, you know, than preparing for the battle. When we're, pre uh, when we're preparing for battles, we end up fasting. We, we become lean to the things of the world and we, be and we become, you know, we become more disciplined and we, and our focus is getting us through the battle getting us over on the other side, being able to accomplish the things that God has called us to accomplish. It's not, we're not focused on worldly things. We're not focused on the fleshly appetites and desires. We're constantly moving and working and operating in the power of God and keeping that power close to us so that we don't become overcome by the enemy. So when you're in warfare, you have a different mindset. And your and your focus is so much different. But when you're in, but when you're relaxed and everything is at ease and you're not in the warfare, then the flesh and the pleasures thereof become become very important. They become heightened in those times, and then you fall into temptation. This is why the Bible says in the last day that people will be overcome by surfeiting, by uh, by carnal appetites feasting, drinking, giving in marriage and, and doing about their own things because they are, they, that's what they're focused on. That's what their attention on. They're not, their attention's not on the warfare. Their attention's not on fighting uh, the good fight of faith. Their attention's not on uh, the demonic fo forces that are out to, uh, to rob their inheritance. They're, they're just enjoying life, the, you know, and the pleasures thereof. So, the, your your what happens your uh spirit man becomes uh weakened and you uh, and your physical man is become strengthened and in god's economy you're getting your your uh flesh weakened so that your spirit man can be strong so so when i was talking about absalom and we're gonna be and we had to go through david's character and and the things that happened to him I'm not saying that he didn't find mercy and then he found, he did find grace and god did not impute it to him directly but his sins and his transgressions were passed to his children and 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 because of and his future generations because god also took what he did and used it for good to bring about messiah and his kingdom and so he didn't completely demolish it he didn't completely destroy it in punishment because he had a plan but he was willing to uh you know he was willing to forgive uh david and allow his lineage to uh go on even though there was strife and contention and turmoil during those uh times of the uh, reign of the kings, but we also see that the eternal kingdom of David was uh, he because the Bible says when Shiloh comes, which is a representative of Jerusalem. When Shiloh comes, then the the scepter will be passed to the to from uh, from Judah. So. During the time before Jerusalem was conquered, uh, David conquered Jerusalem and he brought the ark into Jerusalem. And during that time, he was bringing the ark into Jerusalem. The connection between the scepter, which the scepter was in the Ark of the Covenant, was transferred to the kingdom of heaven. 
the king of kings was joined with the scepter which and the uh, city of peace and all these three dynamics brought about the transference from david's kingdom which was a carnal kingdom to a spiritual kingdom and uh, and uh this is the promise that god made with uh david because of his uh, because of his obedience to bring forth the ark uh, into the city, even though it was met with opposition, he brought it in. He went back and found how the proper way to bring it in. Either though Uzzah, which means uh, the breach, he he had to die. There is always a transference because he um, misappropriated and mishandled the, the holy things of God. And because he was in that breach and because there was two worlds connecting at the same time, they were colliding the spirit realm and the physical were coll uh, colliding at the same time because the spirit, uh, the eternal Jerusalem, the Jerusalem from above was connect in connection with the Jerusalem from below. And it was, uh, and it was and it was given to the rightful heir, which was King David. And so all the all the elements there for the eternal kingdom to take its position in the eternal realm happened during this time. So God's promise that David would have a seat on the throne for for all eternity meant that no longer was this a kingdom, a carnal kingdom. Now this kingdom is a spiritual kingdom and the king of kings and lord of lords, Jesus Christ, will sit on that throne forever. Even though it was in the unseen, though he had not yet been revealed, the, uh, the spirit realm has nothing to do with the physical. The scepter and everything was in alignment to the proper king, which is, the, which is Jesus Christ himself the only true king. But David made that transfer before Bathsheba was in the picture. God knew that he had to take that scepter. He had to take that city, which is the city of Jerusalem. And he had to take uh, that throne and that uh, kingship from someone that was about ready to transgress it and corrupt it. And because of this good transference of the scepter to the rightful heir, which is Jesus Christ himself, to the spiritual kingdom, then the carnal kingdom became an object of destruction. That's what happened. So it just, it, over through time, it became a, a city of destruction. But God got his plan already uh, already accomplished and this is what i go through in this book i go through that whole pattern so when we talk about absalom and his hair being caught up in a tree that in the uh in the king james it says oak tree but actually it was a turpentine if you go to the strongs it's a turpentine tree and like i said it was he was uh David uh, reigned in Jerusalem for 33 years. And I kind of uh, highlighted that the 33, which in is means carnal man, the physical trying to reach, uh, reach Godhood status, with trying to be eternal. But David transferred his carnal position to the one to a spiritual heavenly position so the kingdom of israel became at that moment a spiritual kingdom and a spiritual reality and so 33 like i said is that there the, that number is an eschatic number which means vertebrae means 33 vertebrae and the coiling of the serpentine spirit or the serpentine that coils up the pole. That's what the, the serpent on the pole or on a tree means that the, uh, because the, we are the temple of God. And so the enemy wants to infiltrate the temple of God. So we are now 
a, a part of the kingdom of God. Yeshua came preaching the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And he, he invites all to come into his kingdom. And now we do not worship in a, uh, in a temple made with hands, but we worship a temple that is builder and creator is God. And this is our human body. And this is why Satan wants to infiltrate our human vessels and corrupt it through wisdom, knowledge, through eschatoric knowledge, and through his worship to get us to worship the created things and not the creator. So 33 represents this pathway to Godhood, which David transferred his position. It's not that he was trying to reach Godhood, but that eternal kingdom is what Satan covets. He wants to rule not only the heavens, but he wants to rule he wants to rule the earth and the heavens. He wants to he wants the eternal uh, the eternal throne of David, his position, this promise made to David. He wants that. He wants the, the, uh, the inheritance that belongs to Jesus Christ above both heaven and earth. The Bible says that all power was given to him in heaven and in earth. So that is why it had to be transferred to a rightful heir. To the son of God. But God first had established it in the natural. Before it could be transferred. To the spiritual. So this is why things had to take place. Like it did. So the fall of David. Had no impact to the spiritual kingdom. It had an impact. Only in the physical kingdom. This is why we are. So confused. And Satan's. He's after the eternal throne. Of David. which occupies both heaven and earth it sits on both as king of kings and lord of lords he the one who rules on uh, david's throne owns uh, you know is owns god's inheritance the uh, owns the earth and the heavens is lord above all and that's why that's why satan is so adamant about getting into that lineage he was adamant to get and he did through Bathsheba and he got it through he got it at first he got it through Eve but God had a plan knowing that this was what's going to happen and and he's always used the female or the female representative to get into the inheritance and to ruin the man of God this is why it says in Proverbs 6 and 24 it, let me go there in proverbs 6 24 it says to keep thee from the evil woman. Oh, well, let's go up. It says, it says, for the commandment is a lamp and the law, uh, and the law is the light and reproof of instructions are the way of life. Mm -hmm. The uh, tree of life, the, the garden of the pleasure, the eternal uh, position that God has for all humanity. See, our rewards are at the end of this life. See, mm -hmm. the enemy re re rewards those that do wicked and to and those who uh, bend to his rules and bend to his orders and and go about uh, doing uh, that doing his bidding. He rewards them in this life, but they they but they will have uh, eternal damnation. We endure this life. Believers endure this life to obtain a reward. So we we lose this life. We lose the the uh, you know the status of this life. We decrease in this life, right? We uh -huh. go through hardship and persecution. We we must persevere and prevail in this life. All hardships. We are to endure all hardship, right? Mm -hmm. But it, it so that we have eternal rewards. Our eternal rewards are 
uh, are not necessarily here. We have, you know, we have glimpses of it. We we get to we get to handle them. We get to handle them uh, somewhat, but we're not going to get the full rewards of our inheritance until we cross over that onto the other side, right? So we we battle the flesh, the devil, and the world so that we can be re, uh, uh, rewarded in the in the heavenlies. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says, uh, and so that we can eat of that tree of life. It says to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of the strange woman, lest not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a horse woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress, I or idolatrous, will hurt thee, will hunt thee for the precious life. So they to abate your life. To you will uh, the horse woman is to 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 weaken you, right? To weaken you, to make you feeble. And I'm going to get into that a little bit because that's exactly what Delilah's name means is feeble. One who hangs down, languish, one who takes away their vitality and their vibrance to be made low. Didn't she not do that with uh, Samson? Mm -hmm. So th that's what exactly what the this this worshiper coming into the uh, the goddess worship, right? And, and following the things uh, of the world and the lust thereof, it will bring you, because the whore that sits on many water is entangled with the ways of life and the pleasures of life, and it seduces you into and captivates you into her, uh, in her environment to weaken you spiritually and to remove you from your inheritance. So Absalom's uh, uh, hair, which was mean that he was uh, he, he was he was an effeminate man. He might have, they said that you know he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. So he has some kind of charisma character about him that he was built uh, outwardly. He had personality, so he was built outwardly. He had talent. He had charisma he had personality he had he, he he was beautiful to look upon he had the physique he was built strong on the outward countenance and his hair grew and it was uh lavish beautiful and but that outward structure his confidence in the flesh and in his talents his ability and his own strength weakened him spiritually right mm -hmm. uh weakened him so he didn't depend on god he depended on his own flesh or his own uh, uh wisdom or his own strength or his own flattery right his own flattery. so the bible says that the people that he stole he stole the hearts of israel he stole their affection they were no longer loyal to king david but they were loyal to him. They weren't loyal to the true administrator, right? The true authoritative figure, the one that the representative of God, the one that even though he failed, he repented, got himself back in line with God, humbled himself. They didn't follow his example. Do you see what I mean? They And they didn't follow his ways, or but they started following Absalom's ways, right? Mm -hmm. and his character and they seen him as being stronger more wiser more built and more capable to rule over them than his own father which was ordained by god the anointed one the anointed one the mashiach the messiah the anointed one that had the the blessing of god had the covering of god david did and they rejected david and turn to Absalom, right? And so, but at the end of his life, you know, uh, 
David fled from Absalom on many occasions, and there was a division between in his kingdom. Some followed David, some followed Absalom. So there was a revolt in, in the kingdom. And so, but God's, but, but God, you know, he acted in his justice towards Absalom for his insurrection, but always David stayed humble through the whole process stained uh, remorseful he and he stayed very uh you know he uh, really saddened by the whole situation he never he never discredited absalom he never he never attacked him personally he you know he was uh he his heart long for his son his desire for his son to do what is right and he and he was uh, he mourned for his son, for for what what you know for what he did, and what he was doing. So he his, his heart was grievous over the situation. So he never like lifted himself above his own son and 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 wanted to punish his son, but he just wanted his son to come and and humble himself, right, and 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 repent of the action and make reconciliation. This is the way God wants us to be. He wants us to walk in humility and always wanting to reconcile with our enemies. But a lot of people want to look at the strong man. They want to look, oh, he he's strong and he's he's got, you know, he's got, you know, he's got all this going for him. He's got, you know, wisdom and he's got he's got, you know, the the built and the strength and he's got the backing of all of Israel. He's got, he's got a huge following there. I mean, he looks enticing. He looks successful. He looks like a prototype of what I desire and I want to be. He is, he is everything that I want to be. So people who are attracted to the, the uh, to the, of the flesh and the car, the glory of the flesh, right? Cause there is a glory of the flesh that people said that they, you know, they attract to, right? Mm -hmm. But they're not attracted to the glory of Christ. They're not attracted to the character of Christ and the representative of Christ because the Bible says there, there's nothing in Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, that is desirable for the flesh. See, you choose to follow Christ. You choose to walk after his way. There is nothing comely or desirable about him in the physical that makes you want to serve him. He, he doesn't promise you anything in this life that is going to want you to desire him and follow him. He gives you rewards after this life. He tells you the, the, of the greater life. But he never, but he promises you trials and tribulations and difficulty and hardship and, uh, and denying the flesh to serve him, which is not very popular. So there's nothing comely. This is why people have to make a false Christ and a false uh, replica uh, depiction of Christ and, and, for, and form Christ in their own image. So that they 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 want the eternal rewards, but they don't want to follow the real Christ. Does I that will give them the eternal rewards? They make up a a counterfeit Christ that they can follow that's more conducive to their lifestyle mm -hmm. and, and not so condemning, not so uh, you know that's not so hard on sin. And, and and not so uptight and narrow because <laughs> it's a narrow way, right? Mm -hmm. So they want to they want the broad path, the the Christ that gives us a broad opening, not a narrow door, but a broad door. And so this is why, if you this is why the 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 false Christ or the false Mashiach will be will be more attractive than the real. This is why the Bible says that many will fall away in the last days. There will be a great falling because nobody has nobody has that uh, desire 
to walk humbly before God, to walk in a moral, uh, with moral uh, morality, with integrity, with uh, and, and with uh, little. We want to prompt flesh, right? And we want to lean upon our own strengths and we want to be validated in our own strengths and we and you know we want to be um we want to somehow get the best in this life be successful obtain worldly possession have honor have position in this life but all these things should diminish to doing the will of God. That's why we go through the trials and the testings of this life so that we prepare for the next life. Uh, so this life may look, don't may not look as glamorous as, as those who follow the false Christ, right? So Absalom is it is a prototype of a of a antichrist or a, a counterfeit Mashiach anointed one that is glorying in the flesh. And people are, are attracted to that instead of really being attracted to the real Mashiach, which, which David was the anointed one, the true inheritor, selected by, by God as a boy. And a tree is a feminine tree. This tree and uh, this tree, you know, is. It's, it's got blossoms. It hangs down really, really low. But there's some interesting characteristics about this tree that he ended up being killed upon. What got He got entangled. When, when I told you that the juniper tree, the, the root word for that ju word, uh, uh, in the Hebrew means to bind, to attach, to uh, yoke yourself with. See, you're going to be destroyed by the things that you yoke yourself with, right? If you yoke yourself with the things of this world, if you yoke yourself with people, if you yoke yourself, if you're unequally yoked with a non-believer, if you're unequally yoked in in your affairs, if you're unequally yoked, they will, instead of you being their influence, they will yoke you into sin and falling, right? Mm -hmm. This is the, uh, the Satan's agenda is to get us yoked, entangled and not and you can't be easily get set free. Right. right. This is exactly what mm -hmm. happened to Aslan. He he you know, he went above he, he went above, you know, his, uh, you know, his. Uh, he went above measure you know what i'm saying he uh, there was no more mercy for him even though david showed mercy for him loved him wanted him to repent his arrogance and his uh, uh pride would not allow it so he was yoked to this character his own strength his own pride right mm -hmm. which represents his flesh which when i when i look at that kundalini spirit and the awakening of the kundalini spirit i go back to that it's a feminine spirit mm -hmm. so what does satan want to do he wants to he uses the lust of the flesh to awaken that kundalini spirit that is the serpentine spirit that coils up the spine but it's actually a feminine spirit so we all been uh, bitten or infiltrated by the seed of the serpent, the word of the serpent, the corruption in the flesh, right? The lust thereof. And I spoke on that before because lust was created by Satan, not by God. The lust did not come from God, but it was, but it was put into man at the fall through the serpent seed. And that's why flesh cannot glory in God's presence. This is why flesh is not accepted by God. He resurrects the new man, the inner man, and he deals with the inner man and he's transferring, uh, transforming your soul to interact with you, to bring about his nature and his characteristics. This is why the flesh must die because the flesh is corrupt all by itself. 
the lust thereof, and those are the things that have to die to be accepted in the in the role of God. But what does Satan wants to do? He wants to awaken those things in the flesh, right? And he does it through that feminine spirit, which is the fem the feminine spirit is pleasure, right? The pleasures of the flesh. That gets us to bow down to the to the flesh, and the weakness of the flesh is where Satan, you know, his main uh, avenue to get into people's life, right? Right. So that word, it, it, that turpentine tree, is a feminine tree, and uh, and I'm uh, uh, and a. Uh, and it means the turpentine tree, known commonly as turbinate, a species uh, native to the Mediterranean Sea and the eastern shores of the Mediterranean Sea or Syria, Lebanon, and Israel. Um, let's keep going down. No, it, it is a small deciduous, deciduous tree. A large shrub growing to 10 millimeters tall, uh, or 10 meters tall, I'm sorry. The leaves uh, are compound, 10 to 20 centimeters long. It is a di diocesis, diocesis, I guess I'm pronouncing that right, diocesis tree, which that diocesis tree means it both has both male and female it's a, a uh, within it organs a androgynous or androgynous tree or diocesius tree or, or a monocesius polymosidius diocesius tree are uh, are having both male reproductive organs on one plant and bisexually perfect flowers on another plant of the same species. So the diocesis, diocesis adjective are plant species having male and female reproductive organs on different individual plants. So they, the plant itself carries both male and female a reproductive organs, right? Mm -hmm. So it, with, mm -hmm. within one uh, species of this plan. Uh, so the, uh, the gynodesis adjective is having a female reproductive organ on one plant and a bisexual perfect flower on another plant of the same species. A monothesis adjective, plant species having male and female reproductive organs on the same plant so it is a diocesis plant so that means they they has both genders rooted in this plant right mm -hmm. or on this plant so it so we can see that this and i thought this was a good analogy because absalom even though he was a man he had man characteristics he's a man you know attributes but he was acting in a in an infeminate way, right? Which infeminate means uh, one that has female traits, right? You're not you're not a woman, but you have female characteristics, traits, and attributes. You're soft, and that word in uh, in First Corinthians six and nine, mm -hmm. it says that. Uh, uh, let me look, six and know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor Id idolaters, nor infeminate, uh, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. So no infeminate will inherit the kingdom of God because you are care you are a duality to your species you are you're carrying uh, you look on the outward you're m masculine but inward the bible says that word uh, in in the hebrew means to be soft soft to the touch a canamite or a homosexual 
so you're soft inside you act you're feminine you 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 uh you desire soft things you're not you're not strengthened from within right you because the world has softened you the pleasures of the world and then you bow when you bow to that feminine goddess or the female form or the feminine uh characteristics which is babylon and the and the things of babylon you become weakened in your in your abilities right in your core abilities so absalom being uh his hair was showing this infeminate a character which got caught in a a a what an androgynous type plant or tree which saying that his spirit man was small soft and touch he was uh he was ruled and led by that feminine spirit that serpentine spirit that is that is infiltrated and and made things upside down and backwards so the roles have reversed when it comes to the genders because male uh, male beca are becoming more soft and docile and women are becoming more masculine and hard right and mm -hmm. and and hard and bitter and and more cold so we're seeing this uh this transference you know of 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 not trans what this upside down dynamic of the both male and female because the woman the bible says that the woman is to submit to her husband in all things right so and then the uh, the scriptures command a man to love their wives so uh so we're seeing that men are are to rule and they're to be strengthened and they're to be co-heirs with god in their households right in the in their business and in their way of lives they're not to uh, be outside of faith and of the holy spirit when they are leading because the faith in god the word of god and the uh and the uh and the uh it, you know and the union and the communion with god will strengthen the inner man to become responsible take upon the attributes and the characteristics of a male that is responsible that takes authority and dominion and knows how to rule his household well right mm -hmm. but the, but a female it, you know it, it, this uh sinful innate desire is to rule her household and to become dominant over the male and this is why we are commanded to submit because it's hard for a woman to at work and operate in and trust a man because men have failed in their character of being able to rule because they don't rule with God. When, when they don't rule with God, then they are ruled by their flesh. And when they're ruled by their flesh, they are soft in the attributes that are been bestowed by God to rule as men. You have to be a man of God, joined to masculine, uh, a masculine God that's going to lead you into masculinity and to rule, not dominate, to rule in the proper order and the proper way. Because God is love, isn't he not? Mm -hmm. And to be able to deny yourself and be able to crucify the flesh and put others before you. Because most men that are infeminate, are very self-loving men and they and they and they uh, they don't deny themselves and it, and they're very self-centered and so this is why and the, and women are the same so we live in a culture right now that is very self-absorbed and this is why we are are we're being our character is being we're you know being um distorted and misaligned and this is what salvation does bring us back into an alignment right right to our our original creation this is why absolutely even though he had you know he was masculine on the outside but inward because he didn't was not connected to his father or his forefathers he wasn't connected to the god of israel he 
desire worldly things and the things of the world are feminine the world itself the earth itself is feminine when you worship the earth and the things of the earth you will become a man infeminate and a woman you become dominant you become over the man or over masculinity and because the role reverses and what do you do you magnify that which is corrupt and out of order and just and distorted right this is why you have conflict within the genders you don't have uh harmony within marriages you're not coming together harmoniously because you're competing and fighting in, within the genders to dom who's going to dominate right so that was to me that i thought that was even though i might have not pronounced these names right as plants because i'm not really much of a studier on plants i thought that was interesting that that turpentine you can go into the strong where uh, it says oak in scripture but it's actually turpentine which a uh, turpentine is androgynous species of trees isn't that interesting yeah and so <clears throat> so we're also so we're looking at uh uh so that's why, and it also, let me go back to that, because it also had another characteristic that I was interested in sharing that kind of also described Absalom and why he did what he did and why this tree was such a, was, uh, you know, was a symbol of his, his own, uh, his own personality, his own character, right? It says, um, so the flowers range from purple to green. The fruit is size of a pea and turns from red to brown, depending on the degree of maturation. The whole plant emits a strong smell. Bitter residents of uh, 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 residence, I'm sorry, or medicinal. The species proper propagates by seeds and shoots, although marred by the presence of gall. He had gall. Gall, I spoke on that before. So there's bitterness and gall. And Bible, the Bible says the, the, the root of bitterness will defile every good thing. So you're looking at gall and bitterness and wormwood that is tied to this tree which is unforgiveness, selfishness. Uh, Simon the sorcerer had, you know, you know, they perceived that he had a goal of bitterness. He was he had was defiled from within, from the core, because of his uh, selfish ambition and his uh, and his desire for to use the things of God or to usurp the things of God for their, their own benefit. And so there was a gall, there's a worm in there. So there's like the core of him was corrupt to, to the, the goal. And I wrote a little bit about the wormwood and gall and, and, and how that relates to uh, the uh, bottomless pit and how that uh, the wormwood and and how the goal is uh, is the you know you either have uh, living water flowing out of you or you have uh, per, you know corrupt goal coming out of you bitter bitter waters so he had bitter waters flowing from him so from his core so I thought that was interesting and I did uh, some study on gall and and. And how it corrupts everything around you. So, anyways, I thought that was an inter interesting uh, tidbit about this tree that uh, that uh, Absalom was, you know, it was entangled with, bound to, attached to before his death. It's funny how God uses these characteristics to show us certain things about ourselves. What ensnares us? What's what? What is what? Uh, what uh, was actually uh, uh, plaguing our soul? And he and he and he uses symbolisms to show us this thing. These things. So, so it was a. Uh, it says so a very strong and resistant tree which survives in degraded areas where other species have been eliminated. So it keeps growing. Um, uh, 
I uh, said so the trees are more abundant in mountains and in islands, usually found in frequently in areas of the Mediterranean influenced by the sea that moderates the climate. They're mis mystic trees, mystic trees. Uh, does uh, does not reach the size of the uh, the Pistilla tabrith, but the hybrids are very difficult to distinguish. The mixing of both male and female, so they're a hybrid tree. They're an androgynous tree. Uh, So in other words, I thought that was pretty interesting. So we so we see, and so it, it was actually Amon and Tamar, uh, Tamar that uh, that was David's son that Absalom had killed because he loved Tamar. Amon, sorry, I got that name wrong last in my last video, but Amon, his his name means faithful, which is you know. A, con a contradiction to his father because he was not faithful. He was not faithful to the the uh, the attributes and the characters of his forefathers, and he raped Tamar, even though Tamar represents uh, a god a godly woman. She pleaded with him not to do that, and her uh, name means palm tree, palm tree, which palm tree is feminine. Which is, but palm tree is a it is a uh, tree that is also given to Tamar, Judah and Tamar, and we see that palm trees were in the which I don't always agree that it was should have been in the uh, temple, but we see a feminine aspect. Uh, but uh, but it's a it's a uh, it's a flop you know a floppy uh, drape droopy leaves but it's in a but it but it but it grows in uh desert climates and it and it and it's got a, a good stature so god you know sees uh palm trees even though it's a feminine characteristic he sees palm trees as a blessing we look in isaiah uh let me see psalms 92 palm trees and uh, cedar trees are are the ways of the righteous the the ways of uh, that uh, that um, flourish in desert desolate places right mm -hmm. in dry places they become fruitful and they they're not barren when other trees are barren right and so these are uh, they are a depiction of the righteous the righteous of the Lord. And it says in Psalm 92, 11, 14, it says, my eyes also shall see my desires on my enemies and my ears shall hear my desires of the wicked that rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree, right? Mm -hmm. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that he plants in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. So when, but, you know, God says that we're not create, supposed to be creating any image, image above uh, in the heavens, on the earth or beneath the earth. We're not to make uh, any idols or images, but he uses symbolism to describe and vegetation, and he uses the agricultural terms to show us the ways of the righteous, right? And the ways of the wicked. And he calls uh, the palm tree to flourish in dry desert places. And they are planted uh, in the house of the Lord, shall flourish in the courts of his house. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. To show that the Lord is upright, he is my rock, and there is no unrighteous in him. So we're looking at oak trees, cedar trees, and palm trees, and uh, uh, shittim trees or shittim wood, palm trees, things like that. Are uh, They are uh, 
fruit bearing trees. These are uh, they they got leaves and they and they but these strings are of a care different characteristics because they have a core about them that is strong. They have an inner core, right? That it represents the things of God. Shittim wood, for instance, was the Achaean. Achaean trees, which built the ark, the showbread, the furnishing of the tabernacle, right? And the temple itself. And it says uh, the Achaean the tree grows in, Tim in Timna parts or in the Nevev, which is the desert part of Israel. This is the southern part of Israel. This is generally understood to be the Achaean, which is adopted in uh in the uh rv i don't know what that means uh there are several varieties which grow in egypt and palestine the achaean sidial being the most common they differ from the achaeans known in england which are from the north american the wood was extensively used in building the tabernacle the ark the table of showbread and the altar and the altar where also made of the same, it is called Shitta, Shitta tree in Hebrew. Shitta is a singular in Isaiah 41, 41 and 19. The burning bush in, uh, in Hebrews was the same tree, has been considered to be the wild Achaia or Nyticia. Livingston judged that from the tabernacle the uh i don't know these words but anyways they are uh caramel thorns was used which called which they call this an imperishable wood so they this wood which they think it was also a part uh, another species or a plant base of the same uh line of trees was was the burning bush uh which was imperishable you, he, it couldn't be burned up. It couldn't be destroyed. It was unmovable. It was unshakable. It couldn't. You couldn't. It couldn't be destroyed. This wood. Do you see what I mean? It had a it had a uh, characteristic of it being imperishable wood, which God used. And it, you know, it's, it looks very small, small tree with with a little bit of flu, uh, foliage on it, but it's it was like. But it had a but it had a, a supernatural almost attribute to it, it being you know capable to resist resist the hardships uh, of what the abuse of what life can do right <laughs> so it's it, it withstands the uh, the test uh, you know the testings of life so uh, also the shittim wood let me go to another uh, uh this is uh let me see if i can Let's see, without knots, uh, the Achaean tree, without any knots or uh, fissures, were cut by Jacob, the patriarch, and were taken down by him into Egypt to preserve by his children for future use in the wilderness. Wherefore, we read in Exodus 35, 4, every man with whom was found Shittim would... Uh, It was right the people should refrain from using them from any common purpose in order that the wood might be consecrated solely for the art to which he uh, replied. By all means, remain treats to the customs of their father, which was not used uh, again for pur uh, such purposes. So it was uh, it was only designated for the uh, consecrated for the things of God. Uh, so it says, oh, it says, um, 
Let me go up. Says the Shittim would alone was selected in order to atone for the sins that Israel was to commit commit in Shittim. Uh, indeed, while uh, uh, Phineas assuaged uh, the divine wrath, so this was the same. Uh, he used that Shittim would. So there was, uh, and it says, also shall the future healing of the plagues of Shedem, a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord and shall water the valleys of Shedem. So there's a blessing with this one. So there's some uh, rabbinical literature to that. But uh, let me look and see if that was all that I have. Yeah, so the Shedem wood was uh, was used to consecrate, uh, a consecration for divine purposes. And it was under, uh, it was a, 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 an, an imperishable tree. I thought that was pretty interesting uh, that God uses these things. And also, let's see, uh, and the cedar tree and the oak tree. I thought I had the oak tree, see, which means something that is strong, something that is firm, that has stature. And so these are the things that God calls believers to be. And since we are talking about birds and they lodge in trees in the birds record, and I spoke a bit, a bit about that, but in Greek mythology, the siren, I wanted to mention this, uh, the siren is, is um, known uh, by the mermaid, uh, like she's a mermaid. It says in the uh, in ancient Greece, uh, wrote in the epic, the Odysseys, uh, the building uh, occupied in its flowery meadows. No fishermen worked in its shores. Those who passed in their black ships heard only voices twining over the windless waves, singing a song that promised knowledge of all things. Once they heard it, they were enchanted. They had no choice but to land and seek out the singer. Those who did never left the island. Their bodies remained rotting, uh, uh, rotting uh, amid the flowers from none who heard the siren song. The siren is known as the mermaid uh, should escape it. The story of the sirens have inspired writers, poets, and artists for millennials. But somewhere along the way, their form was confused. Today, sirens are all almost always represented, represented as voluptuous mermaids whose beauty and sexuality lure men to their death. But the classical Greeks understood the sirens differently. A bird woman. They, uh, she was originally a bird woman, not a mermaid creature that the Mediterranean created with hidden mythology was unearthed by Emily Wilson, city of Pennsylvania classic whose New England translation of Homer's Odyssey had won her accolades for its modern language and style. The story of the Greek warrior King Odyssey, flung, far flung, 10-year journey home from the War of Troy, was first translated into English in 1615. Notably, Wilson is the first woman to publish a full English translation in the recent Twitter thread, she dug into the legitis, uh, origins, legitistic uh, origins of Homer's verses of the Cyrene. Many translators, she concluded, had let modern cultures influence their translation, ultimately wrapping our image of those myth mythological creatures and the natures of their seductive power. The logistics of the mystic uh, pursuer, uh, persecutor, uh, pursuers to the sirens are somewhat mysterious. So the sirens, so in the books of the Odyssey and how it got translated, she was originally 
a bird woman. And we see that in scripture because then we see in Zechariah in different places where how the, the birds uh, are depicted as the feminine. Uh, in this book right here, I'll go into uh, the uh, the image that was seen and how God called that wickedness and the, the birds or the stores that flew one flew one uh, east, one through west, and how this was the wickedness over all the earth and how this goddess worship and how this uh, and how we have worshiped the things of the earth and the and the patterns of the earth has uh, has uh, has uh, polluted man to the degree that th their uh, their character that God had uh, had ordained for them to be has been upside down through 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 eons and uh and it's the secret that lies dormant to humanity uh that the this is the the upside down which in this book i go into a lot of the uh upside down kingdom and how that everything has been flipped on its head and that we are to be uh converted but satan has made us an inverted soul and has uh, twisted in how he has mixed both male and female, and that we are in this journey of salvation is bringing our our soul in alignment to the creation of God, right? So this is why it is imperative that we understand, and as we move into the end times, we are seeing the outcomes of transgenderism and, uh, and homosexuality coming into uh it, it, it is becoming um, more uh, acceptable in society, correct? And more of the the uh, you know more more prevalent, more known, more more accepted, more um, identified, because Satan is about ready to set up his own kingdom, because the pattern of all of you know what has been. What we have been worshiping all these years, the things that the, the conditions of our own psych, uh, psyche and our uh, psychological makeup is coming into reality. Does that make sense? And so things that were laid dormant, Satan has um, cultivated within our culture. And it, because it's being cultivated and because we have bowed to the, the goddesses of this world, we are being developed into the characteristic of this upside down kingdom, which the woman is the dominant figure, the one that rules, the one that leads, the one that is empowered, and the man is been being subjugated, which is the opposite of what God had des had designed it in, in originally, right? He uh, he has designed order that Christ be the head of every man and the woman to be to reflect the glory, and that is not the 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 kingdom, the Sodomite kingdom, which is Satan is the king of Sodom, and he is inverting everything which God has established. This is why we must understand this stuff, because we are that is our inward struggle right we're struggling with the culture we're struggling with our own uh, innate desires that have been uh, that are being cultivated by the world system to act and to behave in certain things that are contradiction to the word of god that's contrary to the word of god which is going to lead us outside of god's perfect will and plan and lead us outside of the kingdom of god altogether right this is why we must know of these things. This is why we must understand that the word of God uh, is showing us th these symbols to let us know that the, uh, you know, the earth and the fullness there is, is feminine. And if you worship it, you're going to do opposite of what God, because God is the creator. Our attention and our focus should be on him, not on the earth, right? Mm -hmm. And we are to we are to receive of him his of his glory of his of his character of his holiness so that we walk in perfect unity with him in sync with him. We're synchronized with 
his way the, of, of the original design. Mm -hmm. And with him, because he makes us men and women of God. Yes. He makes us uh, and make us act and do what is right. This is why he made us. He made us in his likeness and in his and uh, in his uh, in his image and in his likeness. But we're when we're walking in the flesh, we are actually contrary to that, right? We're in contradiction to that. And it says uh, in Romans one and eighteen, and I'm going to end on that. It says. Um, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. Because, see, this is the, the truth that is being held from, from the beginning, that we, to be saved, to be, to be converted, is to come out from among them, those that have uh, corrupted themselves with the traditions of this world and to uh, convert ourselves back into the same, the characteristic that God originally designed for both male and female. This is the saving of our souls, right? This is saving because we've got to have the right character. We've got to have the right uh, attributes. We have to have the right uh, gender to be able to be, uh, to come into the realm of heaven. Even though the Bible says that there is no male and female in the spirit realm, we have to come into our rightful roles here on earth to be accepted by God. Mm -hmm. This is what the Bible says when you know, Jesus, when the, you know the man of God or the man, uh, they, he he always he always uh, titled. Every prophet, man of God, a man uh, uh, born of woman, the man born of woman. Do you see what I mean? He always initiated the man, the head, the headship first, the order, so that we would never get it backwards, right? Because everything in this world is getting it backwards. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and uprightness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness because that which was be known of God is manifested in them for God has showed it unto them for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even the eternal power and God head there's a headship so that they are without excuse because that when they knew God they know his head headship they know his order they glorify him not as God, neither were thankful, but be, became vain in their imagination, upside down, and their foolish hearts were darkened, professing themselves to be wise. Remember, the bird represents wisdom and uh, the wisdom of the earth, the, uh, you know, knowledge, wisdom, uh, and uh, uh, fruitfulness. These are what the and fertility. Uh, these are the this is uh, this is what Satan lures you into wanting to be wise. They want to be wise. They're going into Gnosticism. They're going into false religions They're going. They're coming outside of the realm of God. Right. Because they're being moved by their flesh, their desires of their flesh instead it on the word of God and the order of God. Because the word of God is going to set you straight if you take heed to it and apply it to your life. So their foolish hearts were dark and professing themselves to be wise, they become fools and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image. Every, the idols, the images of the earth, they bow to the images of the earth because they give them rewards, pleasure. Into the image made like unto corruptible man and to birds and forfeited beasts and creepy things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies. They get it backwards. They get it misaligned. They get it upside down. They turn things and twist things around. This is, the, this is what happens when you worship the female goddess. 
the divine feminine, you get it, you get it backwards. You just cultivate that thing which God is trying to remove out of the human soul and out of the human mind. This is the renewing of our mind, rel relinquishing and removing the lust of the flesh. This is our conversion. This is our uh, is to remove and to disempower lust so that the spirit of God is what directs our paths, not the lust of the flesh. Wherefore, so God gave them up to the uncleanness through the lust of their own parts to desire their own bodies between themselves. We change the truth of God, something that's more pliable to what I want, more conducive to the things that I desire more tolerable to what I like and what I perceive as true. And that's the God that we're changing the true God into uh, more like that, like us, the more that think like us, the more, the more that we, we, uh, that, uh, that can relate to our humanistic uh, character, right? More humanistic uh, tr attributes and characteristics. The, and the Bible says that, you know, our ways are not his ways. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. We're not, we are, we have no way to know. All we know is what we, what we know. We depend on the wisdom of God and the knowledge of God and the leading of God because his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our way. He is not man. Do you see what I mean? Or he does, he have the characteristics of man or the thoughts of man. Even though Yeshua came as man, he walked in dependence to the Father, leading him by the Holy Spirit to walk as a spiritual man and not as a carnal man until he was able to achieve what he was sent here to achieve, until he accomplished all things, right? So, but if we don't latch on to the wisdom of God, if we don't latch on to the, uh, the leading of the spirit and, and dependency on him, and, and we're going to be, you know, we're going to be uh, tossed to and fro, right? With every wind of doctors, we're going to go about do, uh, what we feel, what we think. Our hearts are, are, are going to be directed in a path that is crooked uh, and full of untruths. And wickedness because our flesh is, is going to appeal to our flesh. The gospel does not appeal to our flesh. It's the opposite. But we get the eternal rewards at the end. We endure. This is why the gospel is by faith and not by sight. Amen. Yes. So this is what, so we don't get it all twisted. And mixing our human emotions and our affections into the purposes of God, right? It's not based on emotion. This is why men that are moved and led by their emotions, they're more emotional or more infeminate. Because it's not like you're not getting uh, tapped into your emotion, but you're able to control your emotion and you're able to lean more on wisdom and understanding and knowledge and be able to do that which is right because you're not moved on the emotion but what the satan does he gets you in the realm of feeling and to be led by your feelings and your emotions and gets you soft in your emotions right emotional when when the things that you need to be tough on you you become soft in right it be, you, be, you become the opposite. And the things that you're tough on, the, those are the things that you should be soft on. So there is there is no temperance, you know, because it's all upside down. It's all flipped, right? Because, you know, God is love and he wants us to show the character, love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, and goodness, right? And those kind of seem passive and weak, but they are strong when you're actually working and operate in accordance to the Holy Spirit because it takes a lot to love the unlovable. It takes a lot to love those who despitefully use you and persecute you and do all kinds of evil to you. It, because you're not going by a basis on feeling, you're going on the basis of God's word and you're, control, and you're telling your feelings, you're controlling your emotions.
between your uh, mind and soul to in a that to the spirit. This is why the Bible says that he will come and he dwell among us. He will dwell inside of us and he will walk in us. And we are his temple because we don't lean upon our own strength, right? Our emotions, our own, uh, our own wisdom, our own knowledge, our own education, our own understanding. But in all our ways, we acknowledge him and he will direct our paths, right? We don't lean upon our own understanding. We don't lean upon our own, uh, our own, uh, assessment of life right mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't do it the way the world does it and it says we change the truth of god into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever and amen for the for this cause god gave them up unto vile affection for even their women did change the natural use into a that which is against nature. And likewise, also men leaving the natural use of a woman burned in their lust, one towards another, men with men working that which is unseemly, which is unseemly means out of order. It's, it's, it's out of, out, out of, it, it doesn't, it is not in alignment with natural order, right? And receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which has meant. See, the whole controversy with, that, with uh, Easter and how that they recognize transgender day on the same day as Easter is not a contradiction. It's not something that, that a, a Christians should have anything to do with Easter anyways. Worshiping the, uh, the Istar and the female goddess and those and the uh, and the and the um, and the fertility goddess is going to lead you into the, uh, this lifestyle because you're worshiping the things of the earth. You're you're seeking after the traditions of this world. You're you have uh, you have gotten uh, gotten affection towards the the uh, pleasures of the world and. These uh, certain a tradition point you to the worship of the creation and not the creator, worshiping fertilities and worshiping uh, uh, the uh, sex, uh, the re reproduction organs, and and the uh, the uh, the uh, God given intimacy of sex that were ordained for. For marriage, you be you you become controlled by the lust that is that all these images are a depiction of worshiping the uh, the the sexual uh, the sexual uh, responses of the earth of how we reproduce how the earth reproduces right which was never supposed to be uh be be outside of outside of god and his divine order in the marriage bed right? right but we've got that all twisted and so it's the cultivating of the culture that is causing us to worship years uh from eons worshiping on uh, uh, such practices and worshiping on cer uh, such a certain days and recognizing these days in history and 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 celebrating them and so celebrating the emblems and the uh, and the symbolism of it being joined to another god and goddess is going to make you an uh, an infeminate man and a domineering woman and it's going to reverse the roles and it's going to mix the roles into one androgynous creature right yeah which is what we're seeing on the forefront this is what we're seeing in reality we're seeing in plain state what was hidden is now being made manifested like scripture says it was hidden a secret kept from humanity right kept uh, kept from from our knowledge 
and now it has come to reality, right? That the, what the Bible says that in in the earlier part that uh, uh, for the wrath of God revealed of heaven against ungodliness and unrighteousness who hold this truth of worshiping the things of the earth, which will transform you into another life type, will transform you into an androgynous creature, a male and a female. Hmm? Mm -hmm. a, du a duality of soul. With the, and this is why we're not seeing the work of God like we like we would like to see in the earth and a lot of people are worshiping the false christ the false jesus that is accepting all these things which god the lord jesus christ does not accept it yeah he is not getting worse worship and he is it's an abomination for you to even say that easter has anything to do with this god of the bible or the, or the lord jesus christ has nothing to do with his resurrection. Has nothing to do with uh, with the biblical uh, the biblical narrative of scripture, right? It's an abomination. And all those who tie themselves will, uh, you know, are tying themselves to the abomination of desolation, right? Mm -hmm. Until they come out of it, and it says. Uh, for this, God, God, because God gave them up to vile infections. And so it says, but, uh, so let's keep going down. So they were recompense of their error, which were meant. And even as they did not like him to re uh, retain God in their knowledge, God gave them up over to a reprobate, castaway, unretrievable, backward, upside down, inverted mind, detestable mind. To do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, a covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignant, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedience to parents, without understanding, covetous breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So this is why I teach on this, uh, you know, every hateful bird. Because Babylon is going to be destroyed. Babylon and all that is joined with that whore of Babylon. Those who have uh, um, made their bed with her will be destroyed. They, the judgment of God is upon those who come out of her. Her destruction is near. Even though she's in the shadows, she's hidden in mythologies, she's, she's hidden in traditions, she's, she's hidden in the worship of the earth, in, in, in idols, in, in emblems, in, in symbolism, it's still worship, right? God sees it as worship. He says, come out from uh, out from among them. Be ye separate. Be ye separate. Do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. He, we are not to be partakers of evil things or evil or evil practices or traditions. We are not to be associated with these things. So, I mean, I mean, I don't know why the the people got offended. That it, it it fell on the same day that transgenderism, you know, recognized their days. It, I don't know why, because it's the same thing. It's the same. It's the same practices. It's the same worship. Some on a larger scale, some on a, a more minute scale, but it's the same worship, correct? And it's going to and it and it and it all it has the same results, right? Mm -hmm destruction judgment so on that and uh on that i'm going to end but it's but but we're got, we've got to we've got to be that tree planted by still waters we need to be rooted and grounded in messiah in his word in his in in um in christ jesus and I, I I was going to read a little bit on this book today, but but it's about the rod of the almond tree because the almond tree was uh, blossom, 
his power, Aaron's rod. But I like how this word in Jeremiah 111, it says, and the word of the Lord came to me saying, what do you see, Jeremiah? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. The word of God is like a seed that sprouts out and it blossoms. But the tree that we are to be identified with is that tree of life. And I believe this is what that almond tree is, is the tree of life. It, it represents the menorah. It represents that life-giving spirit that that seed, which is Messiah, is germinated in a vessel that, sprout, that sprouts up with the fruits of God, the fruits of the spirit. Do you see what I mean? And we grow strong in the earth. We cannot be associated with these weak trees. Do you see the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil? The trees of the infeminate uh, and feminine, femininity. The trees that, that weaken us spiritually. Right. But we've got to be a tree that grows like an oak tree or a cedar tree or a palm tree like an acan tree with the shittim wood that is strong or imperishable, that can withstand the, uh, the testings of life and the adversities of this, of this life and the wicked one. This is, the, this is the trees that God plants in the earth, strong, vibrant, and fertile trees that grow in desert places. And in that, I'm going to end. And amen. That was good. I like that.